The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This podcast is brought to you by MetLife 360 Health. MetLife has partnered with Teladoc to provide 360 Health virtual care, which gives your clients access to more than 50,000 local and global medical specialists through the convenience of the 360 Health virtual care app. And best of all, it's at no extra cost as part of their MetLife Protect policy. 360 Health helps to defend against serious illnesses so you can live healthier for longer. MetLife, inspired by you. This week's chat is with Captain Phi, stands for Financial Independence. He's 31 and he has, quote unquote, retired. So many clients tell us that they want to retire early. But do they really know what it takes? Well, he's done it. And so I asked him, how did he get there? What sacrifices did he need to make? And there were a lot. And what would he do if he could turn back the clock? Enjoy. Hello, Captain Phi. Hey, Jess. How are you going? I'm good. I'm good. I'm super duper excited for today's conversation. We've got a lot to cover. Yeah, let's crack on. <laughs> okay. I don't think many financial advisors will know your story. They might, but let's just indulge me, you, us. Can you tell us a little bit more about you? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I can actually say that a couple of financial advisors would because I have spoken to a few um, and, Mm -hmm. yeah, got some advice recently, which was good. Um, But for me, I am just a guy from Australia. I'm a a retired uh, transport pilot uh, and I... Just tried to learn a little bit to get a little bit better with my money and finances. Um, I got really mm-hmm. into mm-hmm. Uh, the FIRE scene, and that stands for Financial Independence mm-hmm. Retire Early. Um, and probably, mm-hmm. as we'll talk about, got a little bit obsessive about it. Um, but mm. in the, um, you know, with some okay results, like I, I went pretty hard, I built up some passive income and uh, I managed to leave my work, which was cool, to basically pursue Mm -hmm. um, my goal, which is uh, to eventually get a a small farm, hobby farm, and start a family. Um, So, yeah, so for the bulk, uh, I've I've worked all around Australia, um, all around the world. I, my most recently was in Sydney uh, for a number of years and, yeah, about, oh, gosh, gosh, it's almost a year ago now I... I moved uh, to Adelaide, uh, so yeah, I just have a little apartment here in Adelaide, and yeah, looking for looking to buy some land. And that's I don't know, I don't know what to say. That's that's kind of me. Uh, I'm 31, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. and I like long walks on the beach uh, <laughs> and pina coladas. Um, I think that I keep this exceptionally open ended. So for exactly that reason, you can tell us whatever you like. Um, it's pretty exceptional to have a 31 year old be at the point that you're at. So before we get into all of the good bits and the, and the shit bits, cause there always are, I want to say a huge congrats to you. That's really, really exciting and very rare. Oh, thanks, Jess. And I just, I put it out there though, that I, the strategy that I wanted to do with fire, um, it definitely evolved and, you know, we can get into the nitty gritty about like, you know, how, how Ooh. people in the fire movement, um, plan, uh, their retirement. But I had a number of side hustles in the background and I can kind of, we'll talk about maybe 
the ironies about some of these, you know, side hustles uh, and the stress they kind of put you under. But, you know, one of them yes. was build, building, uh, designing building websites. And um, I had some great success with that. And that sort of allowed me to accelerate reaching financial independence. And so, you know, I'm not like, quote, unquote, retired, you know, play golf, um, go fishing, sit around watching daytime television. Like I'm still actively trying to um, try to build a business. And yeah, it's just now that it's kind of on my own terms. Mm. So let's let's step back a sec because I, I think you've got an interesting uh, approach to the FIRE movement, but let's bring everyone along for the journey because financial advisors may not know a lot about this and it is quite a community. So help us learn a little bit more about what is the FIRE movement and talk to us more about your involvement in the community and I guess what got you thinking about starting to lean into this community as well. Yeah, sure. So, okay. So fire, um, yeah, financial independence, retire early. It's, uh, I guess it's probably like a, a community of typically, uh, younger, you know, throw away the term, uh, throw away term millennials, um, that mm. are essentially, you know, realizing that we don't really want to work this, you know, eight to five grind, um, five days a week, maybe six days a week, um, keeping up with the Joneses, a high amount of spending. And then as a result, having to basically work and be paycheck to paycheck. And so it's kind of all about just really trying to sort your shit out financially. I don't know if I can say that. Maybe we'll get bleeped out. Mm. Um, it's, you know, it, and yeah. one of the, the main yeah. tenants is um, building passive income uh, rather than consumer, mm -hmm. consumer debt. Um, so in general, mm -hmm. like uh, the word, um, you know, like cheapskate and tight ass stuff gets thrown around a little bit. Um, but I actually prefer to use the term frugal. And I, I think frugal has a positive connotation and it's about being efficient. Um, so before I started my flying career, I was an engineer and efficiency, like I totally geek out on it. Like I love it. Like I love uh, my permaculture garden. You know, I got to get all the plants growing as efficiently as possible and, you know, um, just like also I like to optimize things like it's just it's one of the things we learn at uni and it's a fun it's a fun hobby and so I'll just yeah I found this community and I was like great now I can I can optimize my finances which really is what it's about it's about you know working hard but efficiently um, to build capital and then trying to like uh, allocate that capital into investments that will give you passive income. Um, and, you know, there are many different ways people can invest. I mean, I'm not a financial advisor, so I'm not going to sort of offer any advice on that regard. Um, other to, other, only mm -hmm. to say is I did try uh, stock picking and I couldn't seem to beat the index. So I just have a boring index approach. Um, there's a lot of people out there that disagree with me that think, oh, you know, um, you can beat the market and everything. And to all those people, I'd say, good luck. <laughs> um, but the, mm. a lot of the re research I've read shows that you can't. So, um, so typically in the FIRE community, most people do look at things like index funds and superannuation. Sorry, mm -hmm. index funds and uh, real estate. Um, obviously, superannuation is mm -hmm. a still a part of FIRE because if you mm -hmm. want to retire, I mean, let's unpack the word retire early. Um, so what does that really mean? Well, I guess it means before preservation age. So the mm -hmm. FIRE community is about building assets and passive income that can provide you either an income stream or, you know, you can sell down parcels of, you know, whether that be shares, properties, websites, you name it to fund a, a gap between when you stop your full-time work uh, as an employee and when you hit preservation age. So for some people that's 30, for some people that's 40, for some people they're happy to keep going until they're like 55. So yeah, it's very personal. It's hard to just to sort of define the RE aspect of it. But I think mm. anyone, anyone who wants to retire has to hit um, fun, it has to hit financial independence. You know, whether you're 30, 40, or 67, um, you, you have to hit financial independence because you got to pay for your groceries somehow. Correct. Unless you've got a beautiful permacultured garden and you're doing subsistence farming. Can we myth bust the word retirement though? Because you're not retired in a traditional sense. You're 
you've got things on the go. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I say like mine isn't a like a traditional like fire journey. Um I I think yeah. in many terms like the fire it's like a um I'm trying to find the word here. It's like a like a cultural thing. It's like it's just it's become like a symbol like like fire. It probably could be better described as like the fire community, but I don't know what someone in the me- in the media is like use the tagline and now everyone just uses the word fire. Um but mm. I do prefer to probably use the term financial independence. And yeah, so mm-hmm. um like I blog I've blogged about my my journey to fire or my journey to fire uh online and that was a great way to stay accountable to it. Um, and one of the, uh, one of the side hustles, ironically, um, came from blogging. So I learned how to build websites. Uh, I learned about a, a, a skill called search engine optimization or SEO. Uh, and that's basically how you get your content found on Google. Uh, and then I was just like, oh, awesome. So I took what I learned from my blog and applied it to, um, a whole bunch of other industries. Um, and I did do some training and I'm still, I'm still doing some training on it. It's not like, you know, official uni or anything, uh, but it's our vocational training program, uh, and where I was sort of mentored and taught these kind of technical skills. And so what really started as a bit of a side hustle kind of grew into, yeah, almost like a full on business. So, um, it's great in the, I don't need to, you know, put in the crazy hours that I used to when I was flying uh, and I can work from home. Uh, and I've um, started to build like an awesome team um, of people that I can trust and rely on. Um, so in that sense, um, like when we think about shares, uh, what are you buying when you buy an index fund? Okay, you're buying shares in a company and what is a company? Well, it's a business. Uh, it's a business that provides value by, you know, providing a service or products um, and is employing people to do that. And so when I consider, okay, well, I could be investing in someone else's business or I could be investing in my business. Um, mm. And so whilst I haven't necessarily put a lot of capital into it, I've certainly put a lot of time into it. Um, but it mm-hmm. is super fun. Uh, and it's like, you know, it's like that optimization thing. It's like that puzzle. But yeah, so... So I don't really consider myself like RE, retired. I consider myself to have reached fire. Uh, and so now I have a little bit more time to kind of do the things I really want to do, like get in the garden, um, hopefully get a, a, a bit of land soon and I can get my plants all in the ground because they're all in pots at the moment, which I don't like. Um, <laughs> and yeah, hopefully start a family in the next couple of years and yeah, we'll just keep playing it day by day. It's pretty exceptional and I think time is, well, time is the most valuable resource that we have. And I live in Sydney where there just never seems to be enough of it. Everyone is very stretched and time poor. And people that come to see me for advice, they really want what you have, but they aren't prepared to do some of the things that you've done to get there. Can we talk about what were the trade-offs and sacrifices you made to get to where you are now. Yeah, it's a it is a really uh, it's a, what they call that catch twenty two. Um, it is. Mm. Um, it reminds me of a quote. Uh, I, I can never quote things properly, but it's is it live like no one else so that you can live like no one else. I forget who said that, but basically, yeah, you do need to you you do need to follow a few steps and and tighten your belt. And there are trade offs. Um, I love the concept you brought up about, you know, money being time or people say time is money, but I think money is time. And Vicky Robbins wrote mm-hmm. an amazing book uh, and I and it's called um, Your Money or Your Life. Uh, and, she, you know, she wrote, she published this book in like the 80s. Uh, and so for everyone that's interested in like the fire movement or basically every finance book, you know, whether that be like, you know, Barefoot Investor, Dave Ramsey, like all of those guys. They're all basically just a, a rehash of, of Vicky's book, which I think mm. itself is a rehash of a book from the 1700s. So, you know, it's not, this stuff isn't like brand new, shattering the world. Like, honestly, it's common sense. And when I, when I talk mm. to my mum about, you know, how did she manage as a single mum, uh, with three kids, you know, she says, Oh, you just always got to have a little bit more coming in than you have going out. And, you know, so it's, it's really not rocket surgery here, but I would just say, if I can um, summarize it in a few sort of steps, 
The first one is you really need to be motivated. So you need to understand why you want to do this. So I guess for some of your clients and they're coming, they're saying, you know, I need more time. And I totally get that. Sydney can be chaotic. It, you know, I used to have coworkers that would drive two hours to get to the airport. That's each way. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, and mm. even then you're paying so much money on these toll roads and they're still congested or there's still roadworks. There's never any spots in the car park. All the groceries are gone. Like, I mean, I was there for the COVID debacle when people were like grabbing stuff off the shelves. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. I'm getting off track, but the point I'm trying to make is, um, those people, they want time and they want options. So it's awesome that they've recognized that they want that. And I would kind of call that like, you know, to sound cliche, I'd call that like sparking your fire. All right. So that's like, you need to understand why. Um, there's an awesome book, um, on the behavioral psychology of that, um, by Simon Sinek, start with why. Um, so that's why mm-hmm. I always say that anyone's journey, whether, you know, be career, financial, personal development, they need to start with why. Um, and mm-hmm. then you move to the, the how and the what comes down the track. So for people that are interested in like financial independence, after they sort of go, okay, yeah, I'm going to put attention to this. I'm going to prioritize it. The next best thing, right? And everyone hate this is to, to make a budget. Okay. Um, and it's a, again, it's a cliche thing. Everyone's like, it seems to be this throwaway line, but like seriously, just track your expenses. I'm not saying you need to go out and say, okay, I'm going to allocate $47 and 22 cents to buying peas this month. Like, no, that's, when I say make a budget, track your expenses. You don't just don't, you don't need to change anything. Just just start recording them, writing them down. There's a whole bunch of like apps and stuff that'll do it for you. But honestly, nothing beats a pen and paper writing it down because then it's real. Yeah. Hmm. Once you sort of have a bit of an idea about where your money's going, that's going to give you a lot more ammo to sort of understand how you can make small changes. Um, but while you're doing that, the next best thing, right? And this is something that, again, all of the you know, financial advisors, all of the um, authors of all books are going to tell you, you need an emergency fund. So build up a buffer. So most common number thrown around is a couple of thousand dollars, but it's obviously going to depend on your, you and your expenses. And that's why tracking your expenses with the pseudo budget gets you an idea of like, okay, if, if I'm spending $4,000 a month, and I have a $4,000 emergency fund. I've got a month's worth of, of runway left, right? So you can, you can, you can fix that up later. But the first thing is to basically create a buffer because a lot of people get themselves into trouble dealing with credit products. Um, and whether they're like using, you yeah. know, whether that's the buy now, pay later or, or a credit card or a, you know, a line of credit or a redraw. Um, it can be dangerous to to play with debt. I'm not saying debt is bad. Um, I personally have a mortgage uh, on an investment property, but I think everyone should have some cash dashed away as their emergency fund for when the ship hits the proverbial fan. Um, and so the way totally. I yeah the way I built up my emergency fund was just selling my junk. And I'm a pretty like I like to consider myself a little you know a little bit like is utilitarian the word like. I don't seem to really only have things that I need, but yet I still had so much crap in my apartment, you know, like a snowboard that I had mm. used for like, for like four years, right? So selling that kind of stuff is a great way, great way to build up. It's some- funny you say that. Sorry, I was just going to jump in and say, um, I have a member who's come to me and she's a single mom and her budget is tight. And uh, I've said to her in no uncertain terms, you, we need to get you an emergency fund Turns out her budget is not tight to buy clothes. And so she's been selling lots and lots of clothes that she's never worn in her wardrobe to develop a emergency fund. But I just want to, I want to tell you something that might shock you because obviously you're telling us the steps to how you got here, which is really interesting. But for all the financial advisors listening, I think you might, I, I think I'll be fascinated to hear your response to this. With the exception of a couple of basic questions around this, do you know that most financial advisors don't talk at length about cash flow with their clients? That, uh, yeah, that would come as a surprise to me. I would have thought that that would have been one of the most important things when it comes to personal finances. Mm, Me too. I completely agree. And so just hearing how you've done it and the focus and attention that you have or had on expenses and tracking and monitoring that, I think it presents a really good reminder to advisors who are trying to coach people to get to this goal, which many of us are, 
that if you're not helping people create awareness or understanding of where their money's going, it's going to be really bloody hard for them to hit that goal. Yeah, and again, coming back to the why of FI is, I guess, maybe not just the client but the advisor also needs to understand the why and that will sort of give yeah. everyone the, the respect that it deserves around the cash flow. Can we talk about the underspending? So because there's such a focus as part of the FIRE movement on reducing cost and part of that is reducing spending and you being a very detailed, clever engineer who is dedicated to goals by the sounds of it, that's a pretty interesting experiment to see how low you can go if you like and you can go too far, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I totally did. So, um, oh, God, because this is in the back of my head, I got to get it out, all right? So with, like, the Mm. steps to fight, and I think this is important because it'll put some context to my answer, is that, you know, after you've got an emergency fund, making sure you have appropriate insurance. Yeah, Mm -hmm. make sure you have appropriate insurance, all right? That's And, you know, you can talk at length about that, and I think that's a fantastic thing that a financial advisor can help. Um, Five, dipping dipping a toe, Mm. i.e., getting a small amount of skin in the game in some kind of investment as a part of learning. Um, and then that brings me to like step six in the generic fire retirement plan, which is reduce your expenses. So one of the things that I tried to experiment to do was to like cut them back 5% like every month until I could, you know, get my target budget. Now I was fortunate in that, you know, I had, um, I got a subsidy, uh, for my, for my living arrangement. Um, I could also eat food at work, like, you know, in flight meals, <laughs> we would get that. Um, and I would get like a travel allowance yeah. and like a meal allowance, right? So, you know, what I did was I would basically try and take as much money as I could and I would stash that into my investments. Um, and yeah, it sort of, it almost became like a bit of an obsession. Like I was thinking, well, ooh, mm. um, I got a 70% savings rate this month. What could I get next month? Ooh, I got it to, you know, 75 mm. and I sort of pushed myself and I would, um, and I would, I would post this publicly on my blog. Um, you know, not like, you know, how much money, but I would, you know, I would put the percentages up and, it was almost like I was bragging about, oh, wow, look, look at how little I can live on. Um, and it's like a bit of a feedback loop because a lot of people are like, wow, good, good work, man. Like you, you're, um, going to retire in no time at all. Yeah. So reducing your expenses can really only go so far. And look, it's important. Everyone should do it. Okay. Because we are generally, uh, um, very wasteful consumers, you know, things like looking at a plant based diet you know, negotiating a better deal on your insurance, actually looking at, do you need that level of cover for insurance? Um, And again, by the way, that can be a massive trap because I've seen, I've seen people change their insurances or change their super and um, they've lost like income protection insurance or all that or something like that. So this is where you have to be really careful when you're reducing your expenses to actually know what you're talking about and speak to, in this case, I think it's important to speak to a financial advisor regarding, you know, the insurance and the covering your ass aspect. Because if you change, for example, super products and you don't realize you're losing your insurance, like, oh man, that's such an issue. And there's something that I don't like is that interlinking of insurance and um, investment products. And so it's almost like a trade-off, right? And so this is, I guess, one of the reasons why the fire community like to separate and why it's pro- super is probably not super um, popular. It, it obviously has its place because normal retirement fits within an early retirement. But there are these little idiosyncrasies, I guess, as to why people would prefer to invest in a, uh, in a conventional brokerage account. But yeah, um, so reducing your expenses only goes, only goes so far. You're preaching to the choir here to a uh, community (laughs) of financial advisors. So we agree that um, the, the trap of, of insurance reducing at the cost of losing your, your protection or safety net is a very dangerous game. Uh, But I think it's an interesting irony that there's communities out there that are so they're designed to help you live a life. I mean, that's what uh, the fire movement's, really designed to do so that you've got all this time. But then if you develop a really unhealthy relationship with money, you can have so much guilt 
and um, fear around spending. And I, I have seen that. Tell me what your relationship with money is like today. Yeah. So, um, well, for example, yesterday I went out and got takeout for dinner. It was awesome. So, is that it, rare? Uh, yeah, I try, I try and like go once a week now. Um, and like, there's like a restaurant and it has like ten dollar meals on um, on Wednesdays. So, um, you know, so I just got some, a couple of takeaway pizzas, which was cool. Uh, one to eat and then one for the fridge. But yeah, I think I've definitely um, relaxed. A lot because when I was when I was in the thick of it, right? And to set some context, you know, I was working a pretty high stress job and we're going through some family health emergencies. I was living interstate and I felt really trapped and out of control in my life. And so I really had latched onto the fire movement and it was becoming a bit of a coping mechanism for me. Um and I was coming at it from a scarcity mindset, which is I need to reduce my expenses as as low as I can so that I can, you know, invest as much as possible so that I can build passive income so that I can have my time back. And it was this hamster wheel effect. And so when you look at like, you know, the steps to high, after reducing your expenses comes boosting your income. And so, you know, again, another cliche line, you can only save so much, but your ability to earn is unlimited. Yes, mm. is... If you if you're an employee, or even if you're self-employed, and you want to build up, you know, some passive income from some investments, or you want to, you know, build capital for whatever reason, I was just going to say, if you can if you can reduce your expenses, you can live off less, which means you've got more mm. to save and invest. It also means you can potentially work less and pay less tax. Um, not that paying tax is a bad thing, but I'm saying if you can live off less, you don't need to earn as much. Um, so that makes it a little bit more efficient. And when we're talking about fire and the, the 4% rule, the 25 rule, um, you don't need as much saved up. So reducing your expenses is an effective way to strategy towards financial independence. However, it can lead you to this trap of guilt with anything to do with spending and it, it can make you miserable. So really boosting your income, I think should be given a lot more like influence over reducing your expenses. Like, of course, you can't be silly with your money and go away, go out buying crap and expect, you know, to be on top of your money. But as long as you've, you know, you've had a good crack at these steps and you're trying to do the right thing, there's no problem with a little bit of spending on stuff that makes you happy. Because at the end of the day, we're all just seeking happiness, right? How long did it take to get you to the point where you are happy to accept that? Yeah, so look, um, I um, I go and talk to like a counselor, like a therapist, and that's been yeah. awesome. And that's helped me sort of realize why I did why I, what I did. And so, you know, I've sort of been ser- um, seeing therapists now for about a year and it's been awesome. Mm. Um, really, I got to the point of um, leaving flying and everything sort of boiled boiled over. And it was when it, it really what was the catalyzing event was my mom's sickness. So my mom has cancer uh, and, um, yeah, I just needed to get home to Adelaide. And I guess that was the thing that reinforced like, oh, I need to get home to see her. Um, I'll just save even more money so that I can quit my job sort of thing. Um, and then when she sort of took her health, took a turn, that was kind of like the catalyst. So I'd, I'd sort of reached my figure from quote unquote, like passive income, i.e. from a plan to sell down my share portfolio, um, plus rental income from an investment property, which was, you know, which is almost finished. <laughs> Thanks COVID delay. Mm-hmm. Um, hashtag just first world problems. And again, that like fire number was a very, I call it, s- single fire or, you know, some people call it lean fire. Um, it's basically you're not really spending much. Amount. And that's, that's this is the thing about fire is that your savings rate, the formula basically is if you can save, you know, 25 times your annual expenses, you can retire based on some some investment and maths studies called the Trinity study. Um, there's heaps of cool stuff that um, you can read up about that online. And there's a a great graph on Mr. Money Mustache's website, which shows um, the savings rate and the years to fire 
or financial independence. And so, you know, the average, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, I could be wrong, but, you know, your average Australian savings rate is what, about 10%, something like that? Mm, it's grown during COVID, but I don't know what it is right now. Yeah, it's well, it's pretty pretty sad either way. It's pretty low. It's sad. It's sad. We'll just call it sad. <laughs> and if you save that amount of money, invest it in, you know, boring index funds, it takes something like 50 years or something like that to to be able to support yourself on it. But the proviso is as long as you don't inflate your spending once you stop work, that's the proviso of this formula. So if you can get to like a 50% savings rate, which is pretty reasonable, and I know a lot of people that aren't interested in fire and just a lot of fr- friends that I've worked with and people I've gone to school with, and they say, oh, yeah, I try and save 50% of my income. And so that's like a pretty reasonable figure, I think. Um that's a 17 year career. So if you, if you work for 17 years and you're consistently saving half of your income, you're investing it to diversified index funds. Um, after 17 and a half years, you should be able to draw down 4% of that portfolio every year and you'll be left with the same amount of, um, income that you had when you were working. So that's how the theory works, right? But then Mm -hmm. as you start to go higher, say you go to like an 80% savings rate, then it's like eight years or maybe maybe it's even a little bit lower. I think it might even be six years. Um, And so that's the trap that I got into. I was like, I'm going to boost my savings rate as in the percentage of my take-home salary that I save and invest as as high as possible. And, you know, some months it was even like 90%. um, and again, I don't want anyone to think that I was like, you know, living in a cardboard box or anything. Like I had subsidized housing from work and, you know, I had food because we handed frozos in flight <laughs> and, and, you know, mm. so I still, I still felt like I had a, an okay life. Um, I just didn't do the things that my colleagues were doing. Like I wasn't financing new cars or buying a $2 million home in Double Bay, that kind of stuff. So, mm. um, but it had it had pretty significant life consequences for you, right? Yeah, it did. So one of the things I, you know, got I started to get really anxious about spending money, and when it was like, you know, um, whether that would be um, taking an interstate flight home to see a partner, or um, you know, going out for dinner, that kind of stuff. Um, it, it kind of made me feel really, really guilty about the the spending because I wanted to I wanted to save and invest that money, um, and so that's where it sort of became I think a bit of an unhealthy obsession. The nature of my work was that I worked a lot, like ridiculous hours. Like, I mean, eighty hour weeks were not uncommon, mm. um, as well as you know being overseas, and I loved that. I chased as much of those trips uh, overseas uh, basings as possible because I wanted the money. And again, whether the, again, that was probably linking into I wanted the money so that I could have a as high savings rate as possible. And so the fact that I was like away, I think it did have negative effects on my, on my mental health, not being there to support my family. And yeah, when I was um, working in um, Dubai, uh, I was there for a while and yeah, it was really challenging maintaining a long distance relationship. No, it's okay. It's a beautiful irony in that and, and look, this is why I'm I was so keen to have you on today because I think financial advisors don't often hear from people who have done this much earlier in their life to think about how they could have supported people like yourself through the journey better. Um, but one of the most beautiful ironies I think in these situations um is that many people today are working so hard to have financial independence, to help themselves live the best life they can or help their family. But in the quest to do that, they become extremely unhealthy, either physically or mentally. Uh, So they're not in a good health position to enjoy any of the time that they're able to um, create if they do become financially independent. Hopefully they make it there. And what state the relationship's will be in with the people they've worked hard to build a life for, that's a big unknown as well. So I think there's this really interesting unspoken about irony where people are working so hard to help themselves and others, but in the quest to do that, they are damaging those relationships. Yeah, hundred percent. And so, if I had a, you know, if I could t- have a conversation with myself, or if I could sit down with a financial advisor, what I would want them to have told me is like, "Hey, man, chill. Like, you're good." You are good. You're on a good mm. income. You're mm. not, you're not, you know, 
pissing it up against the proverbial wall on lottery tickets yeah. and, and, you know, other wasteful spending, um, it would just be, hey, like, just, just take a deep breath. It's okay. Um, maybe you need to go and chat to, like, a counsellor and work out some other things. Yeah that are going in on in your life and, and stop projecting that onto your personal finances. Um, that's, that's probably. Would you have listened? No, it's a really hard one. Um, probably not. I'd like to, I, I would, would hope that I would have, but I, you know, I got pretty like, like I was pretty into this and it, it did make me a little bit miserable. Um, and I just felt like, Oh, I've got to double down. Like I got to just that little bit more. And it's that trap. And a, a lot of people in this, like in the fire community can, you get in that trap of just one more day, just one more percent savings. I'll just work another week. I'll just work another month. Like, because it, I think like a lot of it is like this fear and this uncertainty or maybe this anxiety of the unknown and craving stability. And so having sort of passive income mm. is, is a little bit more stability. Um, so, yeah. So I guess my advice to my early self would be just, just chill, take, take deep breath. Mm. It brings up a fascinating question, which I think we should all ask ourselves, not only our clients, but, you know, what is enough? When is enough? And that's a really big question that I think is quite confronting because there's always another day to work. There's always another week to work. There's always more that you could do, but it's like, at what cost and what trade-off am I prepared to make? And where is the line? And and in a in a society where we teach people that working hard is everything, it can really normalize a really toxic culture where this exists and people are really mentally unwell. And it comes out in either overspending or underspending. And we don't even really talk about it. Yeah, I think I definitely manifested that with with this underspending as a bit of a coping mechanism. I, I think sustainability mm-hmm. is like really important, not just in terms of, you know, doing the right thing by the environment or being, you know, sustainable in that not, you know, wasting all your money. But like, I'll give you an example with, so, so I have some seedlings that I'm growing at the moment and I have some that like, they literally just like shot up. And so they're really, really tall, but they're, they're, they're very like lanky and they're very flimsy and, there was some really strong wind that came. Um, and this is a, this is a hilarious little metaphor, but it literally snapped a couple of them. I was really annoyed. So I wanted my, to put my snow peas in. Um, but I had some other ones which seemed to be a bit slower and they were like a little bit fatter and, and shorter. And they sort of survived the wind. And so they're the ones that are getting planted out later this afternoon. <laughs> um, and so I like to think of it as well. Like you think of a tree, like, you know, a really tall, skinny one, it's going to get blown over, but a, a nice solid one with a, a, you know, a good foundation, big roots and a thick trunk. Um, it's going to be able to weather a lot more. So, you know, rather than just kind of like dashing mad dash for financial independence, it's probably better to just sort of have more solid foundation and, and yeah, don't sort of mm. sacrifice, don't sort of sacrifice today's happiness. For, to defer for, for future happiness. Like obviously delayed gratification is important, but it's about finding the line that is balance. And I, and I would think for most people that balance is probably somewhere not too far from the 50% savings rate. Like people are probably going to think I'm insane saying that, but I don't think it's unreasonable to, to save half your income. And look, I'm saying that coming from a position of privilege. Like I did have um, an amazing uh, start in my life. Like my mom sacrificed pretty much everything for me and my sisters. Um, and we were able to get, you know, an education. Uh, I did well in school in the last two years. You know, I went from basically getting expelled and drop out. Um, you know, I, I, I go into like 20 different schools. Um, but the last two were, were two were very foundational years for me. And my mom really supported me and I was able to get a, a scholarship. Uh, and get paid to study, and then I got a I got a good stable job out of it. Um, mm. So you know, not everyone's going to be in a position to easily save half their income, um, but it you know it's almost effortlessly easy at the higher income levels. But it's equally it's almost more important to learn how to save and be frugal on on lower income levels. Yeah. And I mean, you're someone who, given the the childhood that you had, you're pretty passionate about making sure that specifically women are financially literate. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, if you look at any, like, figures, um, any, like, data research, it basically shows that women are way better at money, running companies, et cetera, you know, than men. Um, I used to get, like, you know, you get told off for people, uh, for saying things like this, but even, like, in my experience as a pilot, I, we found that women, um, make safer pilots and less impulsive. Uh, mm. more well-rounded. Um, and everyone's like, oh, you can't say that. Like, that's that's sexist. But, hey, it's just an observation. Um, I think when when women, um, and, you know, I'm, as preach as it sounds being a guy, but I think, you know, when women are empowered uh, with finance and wealth, it benefits the community. Um, so uh, there's definitely an awesome example of this uh, with the microloans. Um, so I'll, I'll send you a, a link to an article, but it's basically, um, in the developing nations where, uh, small loans are given to women in the community. You look at where that money goes, it gets reinvested back into the community. Uh, and overall, it builds their economy. Um, uh, whereas when the, the loans are given to men, uh, it just disappears. Um, yeah. so I think that the, empathy that typically is associated with women uh, when mixed with finance can have amazing benefits for everyone. So, and a case in point was my mom. So she escaped an abusive relationship uh, with my dad, who was, you know, at the time he was a drug addict. Uh, he still mm. is. Um, mm. And he was, he was very controlling and, you know, physically and financial, financially abusive to mom. Um, and, I asked her, I remember asking her about this recently. She said, well, you know, she worked in early childhood. She was a teacher. Um, and she's like, she knew the importance of those formative years on brains. And she said, I don't want to raise kids in an environment that normalizes treating women like this. And so, yeah, so she, she left. Um, and, you know, the irony is she has literally worked herself, you know, to the point of death and she has a terminal illness. Um, she worked so hard, you know, 42 years mm. to, uh, to, to build a better life and not receiving child support, uh, from my dad made it really, really hard from it for her. Yeah. So I just, you know, um, she made it work. Um, but had she received the support that, you know, legally she was entitled to, um, I think her life would have been a lot easier. Mm. So, yeah, I think financial independence is important for everyone, but it's super important for women because they're typically uh, more vulnerable and they typically come off financially worse off in a relationship. Uh, and, and just for no other practical reason than, you know, if you take time off to have children, A, you're not earning money, two, all of that lost time and capital, like... <laughs> My mom would do everything. Like she would cook, she would clean, she would babysit. Like these are all tasks that super rich people would pay someone to do, whereas women are just mm. expected to do this because they're mm. a mum. And when you combine that with like you know the pay gap, uh, it really does screw over you know not just Australian women but women everywhere. So so that's why I think financial literacy is important for everyone, but especially important for women. Completely agree. And obviously that was a bit of a baited question because I know that you're about it and you know I'm about it too. But, um, you know, just thinking about your mum's story and it's, it's a really hard story and thank you for sharing because um, it wouldn't be an easy story to tell. I wonder if that's why so many millennials are so interested in this movement because so many of us have watched our parents work themselves to the bone and – not everyone makes it to retirement, which is a really awful, sad story, but financial advisors are so good at telling people, you know, in X amount of years, often decades away, you're going to have this great opportunity to have a great life. And so many younger people are going, well, I've watched what it takes to get there. And what if I don't, what if I don't get there? And, and maybe surely there has to be a better way. And I, and I wonder if that's why we are obsessed might not be the right word, but um, why this movement has taken off because yeah, well, it is, I don't it want is, that life. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's a concept. It's like a dream, you know, you're not, it's, you're not saying like, it's not saying like, or selling, ah, you must index fund invest or ah, you must save as much money as possible. It's really about, you know, it's this concept of time and 
having a bit more control over your over your life. I mean, who who doesn't want that, you know? And mm-hmm. when you think like, oh my god, do I have to work every day in my life just so that I can buy expensive shit that I don't really want? Like, hey, mm-hmm. I'd love a Land Cruiser, but you know what? My station wagon does just fine, so I don't need to spend two hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars on a car. But yet, mm-hmm. where I was, um, you know, in my with my my colleagues, like that was normal. Um, to buy a Land Cruiser or a, or a knee level, you know, European luxury like e- executive suite car, like you know, Mercedes or something, something expensive like that. It was almost, yeah. So I think a lot of people are kind of in the fire movement. They're sort of rejecting this um, status crap, you know, like oh, I need the latest iPhone, you know, I need the latest car, I need to make people think I'm successful and to make people like me. Um, I think they're just sort of rejecting that narrative. Mm, which is awesome. And I think one of the things listening to your story and learning more about you is this idea that more and more people need to detach their worth from their work because I think that that in itself is a whole fascinating conundrum, which unfortunately we don't have time for today, but I think that in itself is a whole different discussion point. Can I ask you before we get to rapid fire questions, what is next for you? Um, that's a, it's a really good question. So look, uh, under like the whole boosting my income and the side hustle thing, mm. I've really seen the power of you know, turning a side hustle into a business by sort of scaling and out- outsourcing. Um, yep. which is why I say it makes me feel like a bit of a cheat when it comes to fire. Um, because, you know, I've worked hard, I've sacrificed, I've built up a portfolio of index funds, but, you know, the revenue from the business is more, than I'm than I'm making like in a month is more than I'm making in a year from from dividends, mm. and so what I'm just I'm, I'm reinvesting all the all that money that I'm that the business is earning and I'm learning now. By the way, it's not my money; it belongs to the business as a separate entity from me. <laughs> um, so I need to mm-hmm. you know detach this concept because until it's until it's been paid until tax has been paid on it, it's paid into my account, and then I pay income tax on it. That's not my money; it's the business's Correct. money. Um, but so I am using the business's money to, to grow and scale. And so I've, I've, um, hired contractors. We've got an awesome team of staff now. Uh, and yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, um, slowly work on that. It, you know, uh, and it only takes, you know, I'm spending a couple of afternoons a week on it, um, because that's, you know, I want to see it grow. Um, but I'm spending a lot of my time with my family. So, um, like I said, it's a bit of a, mm. Oh, I've just lost the word I'm looking for. It's like a, um, it's a very personal time at the moment as we're sort of dealing with yeah. sort of our, our grief as, you know, um, not only my mom, but my, my dad who has moved back to Australia and has moved to Adelaide, he's getting medical treatment. Um, they both actually, um, are at the end of their lives. And so it's like mm-hmm. intimate is the word I'm looking for. Sorry. So it's a very intimate time. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to really prioritize spending a lot of time with my family. Um, and just focusing as well on myself, like, uh, fixing up some injuries that I've got, uh, from my, my flying career, um, you know, working on improving my mental health, prioritizing, uh, for me also romantic relationships, um, because a, a goal of mine, a very powerful movie, uh, defining goal for me was wanting to be a dad and not wanting to be a shit dad like my dad. Like, I wanted to be a great dad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, having time to allocate with my children is something that's mm. really important to me because my dad never really did that um, for me. Mm. So that's maybe that's like my paternal wound coming out. Um, but so for me, uh, I'm planning to, you know, I want to slowly continue to um, grow, empower my staff to, to keep growing the business. Uh, I, you know, I still, I still want to nurture my investments uh, I want to look at maybe getting a, a patch of land somewhere that I can plant all my trees and just spend time with family and friends. Um, and basically just trying to take a deep breath and being like, hey, not everything has to happen all at once. Just mm. just chill. So, yeah, that's, that's what I got in, in store. I was going to start asking you my rapid fire questions. And the first one was going to be, what do you do to look after your mental health? But I feel like you've just answered that just then. Yeah, look, I don't know what you yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, this, like, you know, first of all, um, if we talk about mental health, like, everyone says, oh, just go and get sunlight, exercise, and, yeah, and eat a good diet. Like, those things do help. 
but also some people need antidepressants. Um, <laughs> and mm. I would just say, mm. go yeah. and see a go and see a counselor. Like, there's no shame. See GP, get a mental uh, health treatment plan. I think they give you like eight sessions on on Medicare. Um, go go mm. and chat to a psychologist. Um, a lot of people probably don't mm. realize the pressure that they might be under. Um, there's no shame. There's no stigma. Uh, maybe in some in some industries, like definitely in aviation, there was. I'm not going to lie, but there shouldn't be a stigma about. Oh, there is um, in financial advice. Yeah. So for mental health, like I I talk to a psychologist. It's awesome. Um, I look forward mm-hmm. to it. Guys. Uh, and you know, it's good. It's good. Um, so maybe this is what I needed to do earlier when someone would just say to me, "Hey, you don't need a crazy savings rate." Um, Maybe I didn't need a financial advisor. Maybe I need a psychologist. <laughs> um, but mm. in addition to seeing a therapist, I do do, you know, all those throwaway things. I try and stay active. I, I swim. I spend time cuddling my dog, spend time with my family, and just try and do things that make me happy, like pottering around in the garden. Yeah, that's awesome. they're my things that I do. <laughs> Love that. Um, again, I feel like you've already spent a lot of time explaining this, but just in case there's anything left on the table, piece of advice that you'd give to your younger self? Uh, no, I did have one reserved uh, for this. So I would say to myself, I would say just care less about what other people think about you. Maybe, you know, you don't need to seek people's approval, um, whether that's your mm. peers or in my case, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to impress my dad or, you know, wanting my dad to be proud of me so it maybe come back into my life. Um, mm. But I would say, like, you don't need approval. You don't need it. And that translates into the finance aspect. You don't need a perfect portfolio. Just have a go. Like, it's better to dip a toe and start rough, even if it's small amounts of money and maybe you have some garbage investment because you don't, you don't understand it yet. But at least you started and then you can mm. start to improve. So... Yeah, I would just say, like, don't measure yourself by other people's viewpoints of you. Just compare okay. yourself to how you were yesterday. Yes, agree. Um, what is something that's on your bucket list? Okay, this is a really hard one. Um, and everyone's like, oh, I want to climb Mount Everest. I want to travel the world. I've done a lot of traveling for work, and I'm a little bit jaded mm. because I, I kind of hate queuing up and that kind of stuff, and I'm a bit cynical. Um, but honestly... Things on my bucket list, right? I want to build my permaculture food forest and I literally want to nourish as many people as I can, uh, including kids. So for me, my bucket list, mm. I, just want to be, I just want to be a great dad. I just want to be there. I just want to be like that lame dad that like when the kids come home and they're like, you know, the dad makes some joke and everyone groans and then, you know, I just, I want to but. Always there. So I just, yeah, I want to be there and I want to just grow plants. Um, I don't really have any like grandiose desires to build a skyscraper or go to space or anything like that. Um, I think that's a very beautiful thing to have on your bucket list. And again, don't judge by what other people are doing. So you just do your, you're running your own race. Um, my very last rapid fire question, and I could, we have scratched the surface. We could have gone down just one path, but I really wanted to talk about all of the different interesting viewpoints um, with you today. But my last question to you as part of my rapid fire questions is, do you have a book for me to read as as part of my fake book club? Okay. um, I have a huge list of books that I absolutely love. Um, And there's a couple that have been really influential on my life. Um, Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to to recommend more than one or do I have to just have have to limit to one? Well, look, this list is out of control now because I ask every awesome guest to give me their book. Um, and so if you have a few. Yeah. Okay. Let's do All it. right. So, in terms of like fire, an awesome book to read is The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins. And you can read this online for free on his website. Um, he just mm-hmm. con- he just condensed into a book. So so this would be awesome for like financial advisors to read just as much as it would be for your average um, punter. It's really cool. The first one I usually recommend to everyone, right, and it's a bit cliche and the author is a bit, you know, ugh, sus. <laughs> or maybe I can't say that or I get sued. Um, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, all right? It mm-hmm. is a foundational book. I think when we discussed um, the steps to fire and we talked with, we talked about step one being 
start with why or your why of fire, sparking a fire. I think this book's really good for that. So it doesn't give you any practical advice about like open this account, invest in this product, like do this, do that. It doesn't tell you anything like that. All it is, is it's, it's a bit of a parable and it, you could sort of liken it to maybe like a biblical parable uh, and it will teach you what is an asset and what is a liability. And so that's a really foundational one to read. Um, okay. Awesome. Of course, we mentioned it but before, Vicky Robbins, Your Money or Your Life. Mm-hmm. I think this is a book that I needed, I need to read again. Um, and even though I read it and understood it, I think I maybe misinterpreted. And if I had have picked up her underlying message, it might have been, hey, maybe you don't have to work so hard and have a 90% savings rate to reach fire. Because really, it's about life energy, this concept of your time being life energy and mm. money just being a physical manifestation of your life energy. Um, mm. So, those those are like three awesome books that I love. I think they're suited to an international audience. Um, and yeah, but the four-hour work week was, I think, what really accelerated me to financial independence uh, through, okay, the, through the website. Okay, downstairs. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so I think I've broken the rules there by, you <laughs> by giving you four. You have absolutely broken the rules. You have broken the rules, <laughs> but I'm grateful for it, and I'm sure the listeners are too. Yeah. Hey, you have had such a journey, and you are 31? Yeah, but my back tells me that I'm a lot older than that. <laughs> well, I want to say on behalf of your back that I know – that it's been a long, hard journey and you should be so proud of yourself. It's so exciting to have learned what you've learned, to have experienced all the things, not all good, uh, but to have come this far, this young, with so much life ahead of you to explore and enjoy. I just want to say a huge congratulations to you and a very, very good luck on your journey and your dad jokes. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much, Jess. I appreciate it. It's um, Sometimes it's hard to take compliments. Um and yeah, I know. Like, I definitely, I'm can be a bit guilty of moving the the goalposts. And um, but no, I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so thank you. No worries. Loved having you on. <laughs>